And I said, honey, if you think my apple's delicious, you should try my peach. And I, oh, sorry about that. Didn't see you. Welcome back to another Cold Blood and Cocktails. As you beautiful people know, any tiff you may have, please cast it away because this is a channel of positive energy. Okay? Thank you. Oh, my little apple bobbers, how you doing today? I hope wherever you're at in the world, you're having a great day so far. I myself am doing wonderful. I can finally truly say I'm a queen. It's a dad joke and I'm not even a dad. Anyways, how the hell you doing? We're back today with yet another oldie, but a, well, not a goodie. I mean, people died. And before we get too far into it, we do have to talk about today's drink. Last week, we had an apple teeny. I totally should have saved that till this week. What the fuck was I thinking? Instead, we have a pomegranate martini. I thought it was pretty, so I was like, let's do it. And I didn't have any apples. All I have is a lemon. I wanted my thumbnail to be like me biting an apple with a cocktail, but that's not gonna happen. At least we tried. Not very hard, but at least we put in some effort. Oh shit, my camera battery's gonna die. Hold on just a second. Enough of this chitter chatter. Let's just dive right in. Cheers to you, my loves. Mmm, yes. Flavorful but weak. Sounds like my yearbook description. So today's story starts in the early 1900s all the way out in Vienna, Austria. I think these older stories are definitely my favorite type of case to cover. Just because detectives didn't have all the technology they do now for catching a killer. So it's just extra interesting to see what people could get away with back then versus what would be solved in like 10 minutes now. But anyways, a girl named Martha Merrick was born, but while she was literally still dripping with amniotic fluid, she was put up for adoption and placed into a very impoverished home. Lel Mama was not a lucky cookie, literally fresh out of the oven. Nonetheless, though, she still did have a pretty average childhood, but because she was so poor, she knew very early on that no matter the cost, when she'd grow up, she'd be rich. Some people want to be a cop, some people want to be a firefighter, she wanted to be wealthy. Well, who the fuck doesn't want that, Martha? The difference with her, though, was that she wanted money no matter whose blood was spilled to get it. Mm-hmm, one of those. She'd have magazine pages hung up all over her room with pictures of luxury homes, rich movie stars dripping in jewels, and every night she'd stare at them and say her mantra, money over everything, money over everything. And the minute she came of age, Martha got a job in a dress shop hoping to save up enough to just kind of taste wealth. Like, she knew she'd make minimum wage just working there. She probably wouldn't be rich, but oh, she could lick it if she could. It's like a deer drawn to a salt block, but her salt block was a diamond. She'd give anything to lick it. But she was still a teenager. She wanted to have fun. Boys were just starting to be cute. But more than anything, she just wanted to drip in opulence. Diamonds, jewels, dollar bills used as toilet paper, huge gold pots of cocaine and caviar. Her mouth just salivated over the thought of this, and every day that she showed up to the dress shop, she was closer to that goal. Any holes the goal. Oh wait, wrong saying. But she also knew that she really did exude natural beauty and she had like this youthful glow to her. Oh, did someone say glow? Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that too blinding? Martha was very, very pretty and the other girls at school, they were okay with her nice clothes and pretty hair ornaments, but she didn't have any of that yet. She was still told how beautiful she was by everyone that walked into the dress shop. Like someone call a fucking modeling agency. Damn. And I guess her beauty was the talk of the town too. Like nobody could shut the fuck up about how gorgeous this girl was. Oh, could you imagine what a hard problem to have? I just can't stand being this beautiful. Well, when Marie's Fritch, a very, very rich 74-year-old store owner, saw her bat her eyelashes, he all but swooned. His jaw had dropped to the floor like one of those cartoons, and he was Twitter-pated. Now, this was like 1920, so I'm assuming quite a bit was less creepy back then, because Marie's was like, me oh my, be my protege, which actually meant be my lover. Mm. And Marie's started sending her these beautiful presents, things she'd only ever seen in magazines. And I'm not talking magazines that go like this. I'm talking magazines that go like that. Oh, jewelry, fine perfumes, lacy parasols, pink garters, and an offer to be sent to the finest luxury finishing schools in France and all over Europe where she can schmooze, surrounded by all the rich bitches. Well, shit, if going down once a week on a 74-year-old is all it takes, sign me the fuck up. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kidding. Of course, she said, fucking yeah, I'll go to the school. And when she came back, she was a cultured young woman ready to live with Moritz. And she was just through the roof with excitement. Could you imagine? Martha was simply foaming at the mouth with anticipation over seeing designer runway shows, diamond rings worth more than her family's home, and people who were so freaking rich that they could even leave the lights on when they weren't even in the room. <sighs> mm -hmm, we rich, rich. And Moritz's estate was absolutely heaven for her. She could just walk the pristine grounds with maids bending over 
over backwards for her. Literally anything she needed, they were like, okay, yes, madam. She was like, I finally made it. You need your back scratched? Girl, we got you. You want that pomegranate martini at 10 a.m.? We have that too. Well, Miss Madam wanted to have her cake and let other people eat it too, if you know what I mean. Like a young and handsome engineer named Emil, who Moritz was never any the wiser about. No, to dear old Moritz, Martha was his only girl and he was her only man. <laughs> Hmm, okay. To Martha, he was just a meal ticket, and the engineer down the block could push her buttons like a fucking typewriter. But for years, Martha and Moritz lived in one-sided bliss until eventually Moritz died. And just like Martha had hoped, he left everything he had to her, including his mansion. Score, bitches! Make it rain. And do you think she shed a single organic tear? Hell to the no. Martha was like, I had to deal with a man who would last fewer pumps in bed than a retired train car. I deserve everything that I get. Whatever you tell yourself, honey. Well, by now, it's like 19 24, and Martha decides to marry her little side piece, and they both live together like the inheritance was limitless. As though this money pit were deeper than my daddy issues. Oh, 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 oh. When the funding did run out, rather than work, Martha decides to plan a get-rich-fast scheme. She'd take an insurance policy out on poor Emil, her new husband, which would pay out like 10 grand on accidents. And today, that'd be almost like $200,000, so it's not like this was a tiny little scheme. This was a lot of fucking cash. So Martha's like, okay, honey, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna chop your leg off. I know, I know. But here's the kicker. We're gonna make it look like it was a wood chopping accident. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's smart, right? One swipe, full leg, you got this, man. Like, you'd have to be a fucking moron to screw this up, right? Emile's like, why in the shit do I have to chop my leg off? Like, you have two of them, too. And she's like, yeah, but babe, we spent so much money on my high heels. Like, what are we gonna do? Just waste half of them? And he's like, oh yeah, that's right. You're so smart. With both their brain cells combined, they are a match made in heaven, aren't they? Oh, but really, can we snap for that glow? Shit. Can we also snap for part of my missing eyebrow? <laughs> well, two really good blowjobs later, he finally agrees thinking, you know, with $10,000 we can have a pretty nice life. Like, do I really need my other leg? Unfortunately though, the pair really weren't the freshest bagels in the bakery, and the fake chopping incident immediately went amiss. Emil was supposed to have done the job with, like, one clean swipe. What they didn't account for was how hard he'd have to swing. Yeah, he chopped his leg, but the axe just fucking stuck there and wouldn't go through. So he had to just pull the axe out and make three more chops. Which obviously ended up causing some serious injury and eventually amputation. You had one job. And he couldn't even do that right because when they went to go collect the insurance money, the doctors told the insurance company that it was clear there were several swings to the leg and this was 10 out of 10 deliberate. Like, I'm sorry, but had these swindlers just put this much time and effort and energy into actually doing something honest? They might not be as wealthy, but at least they wouldn't be missing fucking limbs. So now poor Emil doesn't have a leg and the couple's being charged with fraud. Martha attempts to think on her feet and tries to bribe a nurse into saying that the accusing doctor himself had been bribed. Another big no-no because of the fraud charges, they ended up being dropped, but now they were being sentenced to four months in prison for trying to bribe the nurse. Like, they didn't even need to bribe her in the first place. The charges were gonna be dropped from the beginning. Oh my god, these fucking people. It wasn't a total loss, though, I guess, because they did end up getting, like, $3,000 from the insurance company, which ended up being about $20 more than what it cost them in court fees. <laughs> huh. Yeah. So they got like $20 for the leg. They literally could have gotten more for that thing on the black market. The couple does their little stint in prison and when they get out, they think, maybe we should just start over and move to a new town? The mansion had been taken from them. Everything they owned had been repossessed like the opening of Shit's Creek and now they were literally up Shit's Creek. They do indeed move. They find a flat to rent. They look in their bank account, realize they're broke and they do what every sane couple thinks will fix all their problems. They have children. And you know what? Oddly enough, having kids didn't make them richer. In fact, they somehow seemed poorer. Imagine that. who to fucking thunk, right? So they decided to pack the few things they did have, move back to Vienna, where they were so poor, Martha had to scavenge for vegetables around the city and then sell them on the streets. This just wasn't working out for her. Like, she was supposed to be rich. And she liked her husband. I guess he was fine, but she didn't like him enough to, you know, not consider murdering him for the insurance money. And boy, was she relieved when he started coughing. She thought, we don't need another axe wound fiasco. He eventually started to have a difficult time swimming swallowing and ended up dying of what everyone assumed was tuberculosis. Unfortunately though, shortly after Emil died, so too did their daughter, both of whom lined her pockets pretty heftily with the insurance money. My god, we're halfway through and we finally have a suspicious shot. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't you know 
what dear rich as shit Aunt Suzanne seemed to be feeling ill too. Oh no. Mm, here, can I dab your temples with a moist towelette? And with only love in her heart and all good intentions, Martha selflessly moved in with her aunt to totally not speed along the dying process. No, no, she wanted to make sure Aunt Susie was here on this earth as long as possible. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, oddly enough, rich Aunt Suzanne killed shortly after Martha's arrival and because she'd been such a peach to her aunt, she was left a small fortune. All of which Martha spent in a matter of days like no fucking joke, a life's fortune gone in less than a hundred hours. I mean, could I do that? Yes, but would I do that? No. You'd think that with at least one of the inheritance she'd been given, it would come with maybe like a money manager? Like, was that not a thing back then? What the hell? She went through that money faster than a dog with a pup cup and she was back to being broke. Absolutely desperate for cash, she thought, well, I have my aunt's house, what if I open it up to borders? Damn, bitch, finally a decent idea where you can make honest money. It's about damn time. Cheers to some honest work. I'm just kidding, as if she ever did an honest thing in her life. But at least she kind of tried. She went downtown, posted about the rooms for rent on a local bulletin board, and simply jumped with glee when a man and an older woman said they'd each be interested in rooms. She's like, oh, how exciting, just call me a boss, babe. Well, moving day comes, everything goes smoothly, and the new tenants seem as cozy as caterpillars. But just a week into living in their new rooms, Martha thinks, wow, the new lady hasn't been down in a few days. So she goes up and checks on old Mrs. So-and-so, and holy shit, she's died. Martha's just in shock and beside herself, but it's a really good thing that Martha had taken out that insurance policy on this lady, otherwise she wouldn't have gotten her $300 check. What luck, right? Like, damn, she should go to the casino. But then Martha spent that 300 bucks in like 10 minutes, so at the end of the day, it really didn't help much. No, she was desperate for cash, so she ended up going around the house and snagging the few paintings that were really expensive. She'd take this one, maybe put a plant there instead, take that one, and then she stored them in the fucking warehouse. Well, this way, when she called the police to tell them they were stolen, it wouldn't look like she'd done it. She acted so surprised too when she returned home from the market to grab a warm salami. The windows were broken, tens of thousands of dollars worth of paintings were gone, and who the fuck would have done this? Oh, what a travesty, because the whole house is basically in ruins, but what luck! Because not but a week ago, she'd taken an insurance policy out on basically everything. Damn it, Martha, you were starting to win us back and then you go and do this shit. Well, just like before, Martha is one coffee ground short of a decaf, because almost immediately after filing the police report, she stupidly files the insurance claim with very suspicious promptness. Like, oh my god, just calm your tits, lady. Money crazed murderer or not, Martha definitely was very efficient and just wanted things done in a timely manner. Her luck was really running out, though, because the investigator that was assigned to these paintings was the same investigator assigned to the axe wound incident years prior. So, of course, the guy's like, this is suspicious as fuck. Like, why in the saggy scrotum do you have so many freaking insurance claims and so many deaths around you? All cheers to that one, you and your saggy scrote. Martha's like, oh, I don't know. I'm just a poor, innocent widow. Emphasis on poor. Just don't look at my bank history. He's like, cut the bullshit. I know you're either on shrooms or you're hiding something. Or possibly both. And he began this pain in the ass hunt for the artwork in every warehouse in Vienna till one day he finally found the little bitches. And once again, she was arrested for fraud and rumors started going around town that maybe she also killed people. Well, when the elderly boarder's son hears about Martha's arrest and all the suspicious deaths around her, he thinks, I wonder if mom's death wasn't natural. Especially because this cow Martha had suddenly and suspiciously become a beneficiary. Who the hell is she? She doesn't even go here. So he tells the cops who agree wholeheartedly that this lady is wilder than a chilly wet willy and she must be stopped. The cops are like, okay, we gotta exhume the elderly lady's body, her deceased husband, and her deceased daughter. And Martha was all over the dramatics, just flailing around as if this was the worst thing she'd ever witnessed. How could they take my loved ones away from their slumber? Like, blah, blah, blah. Okay, yeah, right, Martha. You just know in her head she's crapping marble slabs. Well, the coroners end up doing a few tests on the body and find that, oh my, each body contains thallium. Just within a couple hours, this stuff will really fuck you up. Like, living with thallium in your system? It's miserable. When they find poison in all the bodies, cops are like, well, her son can't stay with her because she's going to jail. And Martha's little boy was nowhere to be seen, so they started a manhunt all over Vienna just to locate him. Like, where the hell is he? He's a little boy. They check the candy shops, they check the toy stores, no luck. But they actually do end up finding him in a very, very poor area, suffering from, guess the fuck what? 
thallium poisoning. Martha had taken out yet another insurance policy, this time on her son, and she had been counting on his death for another payout. Like, she had a list of everything she was gonna buy, budgeted down to the last dollar. Fortunately, though, he ends up making a full recovery in the hospital, and cops were like, this is the last fucking straw. So in 1938, they hold a big-ass trial to which, of course, Martha pled her ass as innocent, but she was in the bag from the moment they said, all rise. In fact, the first thing they showed in the courtroom was the direct link between her and the chemist that sold her the thallium. Her lawyer's like, well, shit on me, I guess I'll leave now. And the court's like, fine, I'm convinced, and they immediately found her guilty. And it seemed like when Martha's luck ran out, it really ran out. Because Austria recently reintroduced the death penalty, and she'd be receiving death, guess what, by axe. At this point, she was like, you know what? It's been real, life's been good, but I'm deucing. And she accepted death, she was just hoping this axe would be sharper than the one Emil used on his leg. And alas, on December 6th of 1938, Martha was beheaded with two blows. No, I'm just kidding. It was a single blow. But what a way to go, right? Her husband didn't need to die. Her kid didn't need to die. Nobody needed to die. She could have been a model. Or she could have been responsible with her money. She would never have had to work again, even with just her first husband. Or we should say sugar daddy. What a poisonous little queen she was. So yeah, money is a fickle fuck, right? Also, let me know down in the comments below if there's any case that you'd like me to do. I'm always so interested. Thank you so much for being here. I love having you. I know these aren't the happiest positive things things ever, but I'm still very, very grateful and glad that you're here. And you know what? If you want a little bit more me in your life, head over to my Patreon. It's patreon.com slash poplux. You get videos a day early, you get Patreon-only content, and best part, it is cheap, fun, and fancy, just like me. Comment down below, let me know what you thought of this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. You can follow me on Snapchat, Instagram, and Twitter at OfficialNady, and you can follow me online at thepoplux.com. Thank you so much for watching, I love you all, and I will see you again soon. Bye!